Welcome you stay to the second step in our Lenten journey. We come with great hope and expectation as we walk the way of Christ. Come, let us follow Jesus. Let us place our lives in God's abiding love. Today's journey will demand much of us. Lord, make us ready to offer ourselves to you. Come, let us walk together on this journey to the cross. Lord, prepare our hearts and our spirits for this next step. Amen. Please stand to the praise song. More precious than sober. Please join me now in the morning opening prayer that's been in the bulletin and on the monitors. We are reminded, we were reminded last week, the week of the call which gave to Samuel. Samuel. We, we know, know that you also call us to serve, serve you. Today, Today we face the challenge which true commitment brings. Are we willing to offer our whole selves to you in service? service? We, we would like, like to think, think that we can do that, that. But, but we are aware of how many times we have turned away from service and instead focused on our own desires. Remind us again of the commitment that you would have us give if we are to become disciples. Forgive our stubbornness and fears. Lead us forward, gracious Lord, up these steps toward the cross. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. No children. We're it. <laughs> no children today. We're so all. So we'll skip that. I have a long <laughs> sermon anyway. <laughs> oh. Uh oh. Okay. What happened? Another Methodist preacher. Oh, there it goes. Hey, I'm another Methodist preacher. <laughs> You've got. All right, let's do special music. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Okay, it's a little cold this morning. 
Join me now in prayer for the nation. Holy God, God, let let us us come come to the scripture open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, and penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can. We pray that you will, and we wait with with great anticipation. Amen. Come here, Stephen. This picture is from Mark. Jesus and his disciples went through onto the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, 
Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind you, Satan. And he said, you do not have in mind the concerning of God, but no human descent. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? And for what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this, adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of it when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Okay. Uh, we are continuing our journey in Lent. And uh, this is to represent our journey. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to that journey. Last week, we learned about the call that Samuel had. And when God called him, he wondered who was calling, <laughs> who was talking to him. He thought it was Eli. And Eli told him, next time you hear that call, to say, here I am. So we've, we've talked about the call. Now we are going on the journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem. Have you ever learned how to play a musical instrument? Well, you probably heard our band this morning. Uh, so maybe you, how many of you have ever played a recorder in school? <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, how, uh, how many of you have been in a band? All right, good. Uh, Eve and I played the trombone when I was in elementary. I forgot how to play it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so how many of you have played a percussion or wind instrument? <laughs> wind instrument. All right. Or <laughs> love the beauty of these. or piano. All right. At first, you admire the talent of someone who can play such an instrument. And you hope to be like them. But you eventually realize it's not always easy, and it's definitely not fun and games. Um, the band teacher wants you to practice at school with another half an hour at home. <laughs> a good instrument can be expensive. And do you know why more people don't play guitar? It's because when you first start out playing guitar, the strings are really hard on your fingertips. It's almost like they're, they're almost cutting. And you have to uh, build it up your fingertips and work your way through that difficulty and then eventually your fingertips don't even feel tough but they are they're tough and you can play the guitar well so eventually we learn that if something is worthwhile it will probably be also difficult at times but it's worth it Today we're continuing on this journey, and we'll start with 
verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Now, it's not a strange thing for them to say. Why don't they say, I think it's Jesus Christ. <laughs> Where Jesus, at least, I mean, they may not know he's the Messiah, but they would say, oh yeah, Yeshua uh, is going to come and speak. He's coming through town. We know, we've heard of Yeshua. But no, uh, people are saying that this Yeshua must also be somebody else. Maybe uh, John the Baptist, because John the Baptist has stated he is there to prepare the way for the Messiah. Or maybe he's Elijah, because it was rumored that Elijah would come before the age of the Messiah. So they were expecting and hoping that Elijah would come. And we still have that hope for the future, that maybe uh, we would see Elijah before Christ comes back. And still others thought he might be one of the prophets of great hope. They had seen John the Baptist and knew that he was a prophet. And this was a big deal. This was a special thing. We, we think, oh, he's just a prophet. We read about prophets all the time. But it had been 400 years since they had had a prophet. <laughs> and they were hoping this Jesus, this Yeshua, would also be a prophet. Jesus asks, what about you? Who do you say I am? And of course, they all know he's Jesus, right? That's not the question. What is the importance of him? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Good job, Peter. <laughs> that answer is one that hit the mark. But was his definition of the coming Messiah correct? That's the question. And I think that's why Mark has a set of scripture right before the next important set of scripture about uh, Jesus heading to the cross because he wants us to see how people were really uh, excited and thinking all these good things are happening. They've seen the blind given sight. They had seen people who could not walk spring up and do a little dance. They had seen lepers who were separated from the community of people be able to be cleansed of that disease and once again be with their family and friends. And they would heard these wondrous teachings of Jesus Christ. So many wonderful things were happening. And, you know, <laughs> what are some things that they expected of this Messiah? Even Jesus' disciples were still thinking some of this as they walked with him. The Jewish people had waited for a Messiah who would set them free from the oppression of the Romans. And he would be a victorious military general. Or even better, a wise and beloved king. A king who would bring peace and prosperity to his kingdom. This would be someone with political power that would use that power to make bold changes for the good. And it would be a golden age for the Jewish people. And they would long, at long last have independence for their nation. Even nations such as Rome, they believed, would come to the Messiah to pay tribute to him. But their appeals for his favor would be rejected. Ah, great times. Already, as I said, they've seen so many miracles. 
the expectation of the age of the Messiah was that it would be all good. Finally, all good for the Messiah, all good for his people. Sometimes we can get into that as we get into Christianity too. Now life is going to be all good. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more pain. But we know as Christians, there's still things we have to work through. And those things help us to grow, to mature, and to have compassion on those who are going through tough times. We would prefer a Christianity where all once we uh, started following Christ, everything is good. <laughs> it's all good. But we still live in an evil world. And it can't be all good. It can be all good as far as knowing God. But we are still in the world. It says in verse 31 that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he would be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I can just imagine Peter... <laughs> He probably said something like this. Look, Jesus, you just had a bad day. You need to take a vacation, you know? Get some good rest, good night's sleep. You'll feel better in the morning. Nowadays, we might say, watch some good comedy. Laughter is good for the soul. You know, we would all like to hear that, wouldn't we? Take some time off. Just take it easy. But when Jesus tur turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So what are the concerns of man that Jesus is talking about? Well, peace is good. How many people here like peace? <laughs> peace is good. Okay? Joy. Yeah. Basic needs met. How about that one? That's good. Uh, clothing to wear? Okay. Food to eat? Yeah. A roof over our heads? Yeah. Uh, as little stress as possible? Don't do that. <laughs> no suffering? Yeah. Okay. What does the carnal man seek? Wealth, honor, power, and pleasure. Okay. What are the concerns of God? Holiness, righteousness, justice, mercy, love for God and your fellow man, salvation for those who love God. Those are the concerns of God. To the disciples, the journey with Jesus had been pretty great so far. We would love to have been on that journey with Jesus too up to this point. Amen? You get to be with Jesus as he's healing people all the time and he's giving this great wisdom out. Who wouldn't want to be with Jesus? Until you hear this. And then you have to think, well... <laughs> Am I in it all the way, or am I in it just for the good part? Jesus had in mind a much bigger picture, with greater good in mind. And it would take a lot of self-denial. It says in verse 34 that he called the crowd to him along with the disciples. Okay, everybody come on in here and hear and listen to what I have to say. And whoever must be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And I can just imagine people in the crowd saying, what? <laughs> a cross is where you're a criminal and you're killed. 
young painfully. What is this? What is this stuff that Jesus is talking about? And in Luke 9.23, it's reported this way, that he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now it's getting even stricter. Woo. Let's not pass over this quickly. Let's break this down. We must deny ourselves. Okay, we know that. That's the perfect thing for Lent as we are on this Lenten journey. As we have our suitcases and we are going along with Jesus to the cross. As we prepare our soul for the depth of the meaning of the cross. We think of something to deny ourselves. Okay. Jesus denied himself for 40 days in the wilderness. And why did he do that? To prepare himself for the ministry that he was going to do. And the question is, what are we called to give up, to sacrifice, to say no to ourselves? Because we like saying yes. And have you ever given up something for someone else's benefit? That's the life of a Christian. And we, when we talk about helping those in need, we have to give of our time and finances to do that. It's not all about us. And then, Jesus not only talks about denying ourselves, but taking up the cross. And that's the most startling honesty of Jesus. To tell a person that they must be ready to take up a cross, Barclay says, was to tell him he must be ready to be regarded as a criminal and die. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people were thinking, what is Jesus talking about? But Christianity is not all fun and games. Just like learning a musical instrument. There's such wonder and beauty to be one of those we can call a musician. And so much wonder and beauty even more to be called a Christian because you are shining the light of God. You're giving that light upon the world, reflecting the light of God. But it's not all fun and games. I mean, we do pay tithing, <laughs> and sometimes give offerings on top of that. We get up on Sunday morning to worship when we could have slept in. We join teams or committees to make the church run smoothly. And we don't do things that we know would displease God. And we see God as our treasure instead of our expensive toys and vacations. We can enjoy things in this life, but God is our biggest treasure. And he is the reason for this life. So we take up our cross, and you know, there are a lot of countries still where you, it would be illegal to stand on the street corner and hold up a Bible and say, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. In many countries, that's a good way to end up in jail. So he says, we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. He is calling us to call him Lord and Master. And we say to God, such things as, use me as you will. And instead of going our own way, we ask God to guide us. And verse 35, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. The logic of the gospel is illogical to the world. It's almost a paradox. Deny yourself to find yourself. Lose your life to save it. 
And it's not what I want to do, not even what I want to do for God, but what God wants me to do. And once we get beyond living for the moment, we live knowing that God is inviting us to be with Him for eternity, and our focus changes. Jesus says that where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. And Jesus says if we chase after worldly things, we will lose our life. But if we lose after if we lose that life and choose to live our lives for God, we save our lives. And then Jesus says in verse 36, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for his soul? Do you remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and one of the temptations from Satan mentioned in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And Satan said, all this I will give you. Jesus, just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus was a 100% man, but also a 100% God. And he could feel pain just as we feel pain, and he could be tempted just as we feel temptation. But the beauty and the example of Jesus as he was given temptation, he always overcame it, and he always rejected it. It's almost like he's saying, I did it, you can do it. Satan meant to tempt Jesus. It's amazing to me that Satan would try this. Satan tried to tempt Jesus into seeking power and glory for himself. not for his Father in heaven. And we're tempted to do the same thing. Mankind often seeks power and glory and attention for themselves. In all we do, let us draw attention to our Heavenly Father. If we are prosperous, can we really say it's all we're doing? If we're smart, can we really take all the credit? If isn't God the giver of all good gifts, in all that we do, give the glory to God. And Jesus, while facing the great tempter, Satan made a declaration that he would have God the Father in the center of worship. And that it, as he walked upon this earth, he preferred to be known as the Son of Man rather than the Son of God and all the attention that that title received. And he directed all honor and glory and praise to his Father, though he himself is the Son of of God. Philippians 2 says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being known or being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Commitment is deep. We must be willing to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. And he's not asking us to do anything that he himself did not do. We never know what kind of difficulties we will encounter being a Christian. We're blessed to be in America where we have freedom of religion. And really there isn't a whole lot of persecution. <laughs> we can have disagreements maybe with someone, for example, who's an atheist and thinks that we're up totally on the wrong track just as much as we think of them. But that's a little thing. We are blessed. 
that Jesus is saying following him is not always going to be easy. And that we should be willing to follow him no matter what. It's a wonderful journey. But it may require some self-sacrifice. It's the most amazing journey of our lifetimes. The disciples had no regrets. And neither do I. And I am willing to be sure that neither do you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, once again to be able to read your word that you have given us, that it would benefit us to learn from it. Lord, we're so thankful that your son was willing to go all the way to the cross. He knew, even before he headed south on that journey, where it would go and what the ending would be. But he also knew, Father, that you have a salvation plan where your son would be sacrificed upon the cross that he would be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That we would have forgiveness through this great act of self-denial. Lord, we thank you for your plan. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you embolden us on our journey to not be scared, to be strong in telling others about you and your son and your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the journey that you have us on. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ.